I think I've discovered a very inexpensive and environmentally beneficial cure for cancer. And it's really simple and it's been in front of us for oh thousands of years now or well actually just since the invention of the petri dish. I think it is quite possible that elephants can cure cancer. I know this seems ridiculous but if you think about it it really does make sense because elephants could cure cancer in vitro. All you have to do is culture some cancer in a petri dish, call in an elephant and have the elephant sit on the dish. It would cure the cancer. Of course you'd probably have to have the elephant sit there for quite some time so it'd be good if you could teach the elephant a hobby such as knitting, crochet, watercolor painting, even macrame would work. I mean they have a trunk which means basically they have two hands and a trunk to work with so they could probably get some serious work done. So if elephants could cure cancer in vitro they could cure cancer. It makes as much sense as the sourbot studies. You throw sourbot in a petri dish and it would kill the cancer cells but as Mudbroker pointed out so would throwing in battery acid, lye or any other kind of toxic chemical. The problem of course with that is it would kill it in the petri dish but if you put it back in the organism which is called in vivo as opposed to in vitro. In vitro means in glass. In vivo means in the living organism. So if you gave a living organism lye or battery acid or some other caustic chemical of course it would kill it. So I guess if an elephant sat on a person it would probably kill it. So even though elephants would be a lot more than 10,000 times more efficient than chemotherapy at killing cancer cells in a petri dish it probably wouldn't be a good idea. By the way I'm including some images of petri dishes that I found because I discovered petri dish art which I think is really cool. See what you do is you take these little slender glass dishes and you put something inside of them that sustains life. It's called an agar. I think that's how it's pronounced. Then you take your little microscopic cooties and you put them on the dish and you hope that they will grow. Now normally what you do, what people do is they either pour a little bit in in a water solution. These are microscopic cooties. It's not like you can see them easily. So you either pour in a little bit or you take a little swab and you just swipe it on. That's why so many of them appear as being stripes. But there are actual contests and competitions now to create petri dish art. You are given little microbes and you are given antibiotics and so on so you can make white spaces. You know it'd be sort of like an eraser. The antibiotic would kill the little microbes in that spot. The other thing is screen printing. I will show you one of Einstein and I will show you one of Darwin. And then I found this thing on Etsy. Etsy? Is that how it's pronounced? The place that sells where people sell really weird art things. Somebody's making it looks like glycerin soap in petri dishes designed to look like critters and microbes. They actually label them things like E. coli and so on. <laughs> so you can buy petri dish soaps on Etsy. Jeez. So we will conclude this broadcast with some petri dish art. By the way in case you're curious agar and you probably are or you wouldn't be watching my videos. Agar is the solution that's used to grow a lot of little microscopic cooties in petri dishes. It is a gelatinous substance derived from boiling from a polysaccharide in red algae where it accumulates in the cell walls of agarophyte, agarophyte and serves as the primary structural support to the algae cell walls. In other words it's the goo that holds together algae cells. It's a mixture of two components. The linear polysaccharide agarose and a heterogeneous mixture of smaller molecules called agaropectin. Pectin is the stuff that people use to make jams and jellies. Now what's interesting about this is Japanese people, in fact a lot of Asian people have been eating agar Oh, it's called agar agar and I will show you a picture of something that actually looks pretty tasty. Oh the other thing is for you vegetarians out there it's a vegetable based 
gelatin so that you could make things like marshmallows and jellies and fruit fillings for pies and they would be good and thick without having to use cornstarch and so on. Yeah, I will include a little Japanese, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, Yukon Mitsu Yukon, maybe. Any Japanese people out there laughing at me, I'm sorry. It's been used for quite a while now, it, and it's kind of translucent if you don't put it on too thick. So you can see through it, which is really cool for when you put it under a microscope and shine a light through it. You can see through it because it's kind of like jelly stained glass and your cooties grow on top of it. So that explains in vitro. So in vitro literally means in glass, although plastic containers are used because they're disposable. But the concept of test tube babies or that sort of thing comes from in vitro. In vivo means in the living creature. So you can see how in vitro studies of certain things might not play out in the real world because as Mudbrooker said, sure, lye would kill all kinds of cooties, but would you want to drink lye to cure cancer? No. All right, so elephants cure cancer. That's all I have to say. Bye.